Well, good morning, fellowship. All right, confession time. How many of you uh, very responsibly uh, got to church an hour early this morning? Anybody? Nobody. Okay, good. Great. We all, did I see a hand over there? If it was you, I'm so glad you're here. And you're early. You win the prize today, so well done. Uh, it's a great day. Happy November. Um, I am going to keep talking and pretending that someone's going to bring out a table for me at any moment now. Sometimes those details just get forgotten. I, uh, I made a mistake this week. I want to tell you about my mistake. I looked at the news. Anybody else make that terrible mistake this week? Hey, Noah Mitchell, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Thank you. I can't preach without my, I can't preach without my table. So I read the news this week, and, uh, and not surprisingly, there was some bad news in the news this week. Uh, American and British economists say that we are in the middle of um, a recession that is going to last longer than any other recession since the 1910s. That's some bad news. You know, we've been talking a little bit about the fact that everything costs more. We know that there's war going on in the world, and this Tuesday... We have an election that I'm sure is going to be a very painful reminder of how divided our nation is. I would encourage you to pray for that, by the way, and remember uh, that the church uh, is the hope, uh, shows the hope of the world that is Jesus that brings us together. Side note, side sermon. So, right, we've got this bad news, and what happens when we're in the middle of all that calamity? We're inclined to just sort of hunker down. And we're, we're inclined to just sort of just hold things very tightly and, and to kind of conserve and to self-preserve, right? And, and that's kind of understandable just given all of what's going on. But as we are doing that, something else is happening right about now. We're getting towards the end of the year. Some people call it the giving season. And it's the giving season obviously because of Christmas, but it's also the giving season because every nonprofit in the world is about to dial up a machine that sends out mail and email and cards and letters and text asking uh, for money. And Fellowship Dallas is included in that group, and we're certainly going to be doing that. And we survey the horizon, we see all that's going on in the world, and we get these requests, and we all sort of have this collective epic ugh, right? And I get it. I get it. I've had my own uh, journey with generosity over the years. I grew up uh, in some lean years with some fear and control around money and a whole lot of suspicion uh, around anybody who was asking for it. And then I got married, and Martha and I had a conversation about giving, our first conversation. She initiated it because she was more holy than me. That was true back then. It's not true now. <laughs> Don't believe a word I'm saying. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. And here's what Martha, Martha came up to me, she said, hey, I think we need to start talking about giving. And here was my response in that moment. I don't remember the exact words, but it was something like, honey, there's no way we can do that. We've got bills, we've got things we've got to take care of, and, and, and this, isn't that what wealthy people are supposed to do? I don't think we should be able to give. But she persisted, because that's what Martha does. And she not only said we need to give, but she proposed a dollar amount. And you know what I did? I totally fainted. I fainted. Maybe not really. I could not believe it. I said, really, is this really what you think we need to do? But over the last 22 years, God has done a work. You see, I started to read God's word and to obey God's word around giving just because God said so. But as I have, God's grace has loosened my grip. As I have, and Martha and I started to give, I recognized something, that we would give and we'd get to the end of the month, and guess what? We had enough still. And then time would go on and we'd give a little bit more and give a little bit more and give a little bit more. And every month we would still finish and we had enough. But not only that, as I would give, God began to change my heart. He changed my heart towards him. He changed my heart towards my stuff. And he began to transform me more and more into his character. Not only that, but God began to bless me because he showed me the ways in which the things that Martha and I gave had an impact and blessed others. It was an incredible blessing for us. And I stand here this morning after two decades worth of this journey that I've been on and tell you that generosity is one of the great sources of joy in my life and Martha's life. And according to Scripture... We don't have to be the exception. That can be true for every single person in this room and online. That can be true of Fellowship Dallas. 
And so as you see behind me, we are starting a new series this morning called Joyful Generosity. We're going to take a look at what God has to say about our stuff and money and giving. And many of you know the stats of Scripture. I'll remind them uh, right now what they are. Uh, There are about 500 verses in the Bible about prayer. There are about 500 verses in the Bible about faith. And there are over 2,000 verses about money. 16 of Jesus' 38 parables deal with money and possessions, and one out of every 10 verses in the New Testament deal with possessions and money. Why is that? It's because money is a big deal. It's because our bank statements are spiritual documents, and giving ultimately is a heart issue. And this year, if you've been around, you know we are making room for Christ to captivate our hearts as we abide in him. And if we want that to be true of us, we're going to have to spend some time talking about money and talking about giving. And so that's what we're going to do over the next few weeks. I invite you into this and remind you of the goodness and the love of God that we just sang about as we do. We're going to be in uh, really what is a seminal passage around generosity. Uh, We're going to anchor in that. We're going to look at a few other passages over the next few weeks, but we're going to be anchored in this uh, letter from Paul to the Corinthian church, his second letter. And it really is going to be our guide and where we rest over the next few weeks to see what he has to say because it says so much about generosity, God's heart, and what he is asking of us. So here's what Paul says, <clears throat> Excuse me, starting in verse, uh, chapter 9, verse uh, 6 of 2 Corinthians. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Here's the context of what Paul is writing. Paul is uh, making a collection uh, for the Jerusalem church, a church in Jerusalem, and he is asking the different churches that he has planted on his missionary journeys uh, to fund this collection. And the Corinthian church has already raised their hand and said, yep, we're we're in, we're going to give you some of that, but you get a sense in this second letter that they're beginning to waffle. They're kind of backing up. And so what Paul's doing here is to call them back to a heart of generosity uh, to care for the church in Jerusalem. And as Paul writes this to them, he's really writing it also to us, and he gives us God's heart for giving and the opportunities that we have in forgiving and also the difficulties that we face. If this was easy, we wouldn't have to preach about it. And so this morning, really, to kick this thing off, I want to spend some time in verse 7 where Paul says, Each must give as he has decided in his heart. Not reluctantly, nor under compulsion. So how is it that you and I decide what to give, how to give, and what is it that gets in the way? You see, before we get to the, the where's and the, the, and the who's, we've got to take a step back and say, ultimately, what is God's vision for our heart? What is it that God is asking of us? And to take a look at some of these objections that we may have and to bring them to the Lord. And so we are going to do that. And what I want to do is an answer to those objections is to, to, excuse me, to tell you five heart-changing truths about the God we worship and the God who calls us to a generous life. So that's what we're going to do uh, this morning. I want to begin with the objections that Paul lays out. I think we could could encapsulate uh, almost any objection we would have to giving or generosity and the struggle that we would have in the two words that Paul uses of reluctance and compulsion. Now, we may hear reluctance and think, well, that must be a hesitation of sorts, but really the word that Paul uses means unhappiness marked by regret. If you've ever had buyer's remorse, you know unhappiness marked by regret. You buy a car, and and it's awesome for about 30 seconds, and then you go, oh my goodness, what have I done? Well, Paul's talking about giver's remorse here. This is what I had in the beginning. This is what I was wrestling with in the beginning of my journey because I was sure that if we gave, if we were generous, we wouldn't have enough for the things that we needed, and we certainly wouldn't have enough for the things that we wanted. And so one of the big objections that any of us might have around generosity is that, man, we're going to go hungry if we give, or we're not going to be able to get that new fill-in-the-blank or continue to add to our possessions. And the reason that we wrestle with that is because our eyes are focused on us because we believe our stuff is all for us, that our money is to be used just on us. 
And so Paul wants to raise that concern to us. The other reason is compulsion. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on this, but have you ever gone to an event that may have been a gift-giving event, but you didn't really know the person very well, and you asked the question, do we have to give that person a gift? The laughs I will take is, yes, you have been in that very situation, right? So what do you do? You have the, you have the debate, I don't know, I mean, we barely know him, but we got invited to this thing, should we go ahead? And we, what, we either give the gift and kind of give it begrudgingly, or we just say, no, never mind, no, we're never, we'll never see this person again, so why would we even bother giving that gift? And what Paul's showing us is that, that a gift that is given under duress can feel more like extortion than it can actually blessing. I don't know what your hesitation is, if you even have a hesitation. If you don't, I want you to share your heart for generosity over the next few weeks. This body needs to hear it. All of us need to hear it. But I bet if you have some objections or some concerns, they're going to fall underneath one of those two categories. And so what does Paul tell us, what does Scripture tell us about the heart of God for generosity? His heart of generosity towards us, the generous heart he asks us to respond with in kind. And how are we to view our resources with godly eyes, and why is it that he gave it to us in the first place? So five heart-changing, magnificent truths about God that really can change the way that we view generosity. The first is this, and I would say the most important, is that God is abundantly generous, and you and I are created in his image. See, we're going to talk about anything that has to do with our hearts, specifically money. We've got to talk about God's heart because he has put his heart in us. I want you to see this next slide. I'm just going to hold it up there for a second, and I'm not even going to speak. Because what I did, well, I'm not going to speak. Because here's what I thought about doing. I thought I would jump into Scripture and say, does Scripture have much to say about the generosity of God? And in about 10 seconds, I came up with this list. I want to read these out loud. This is the heart of our Creator. This is the heart of our Savior. This is the heart of the one that we will be with forever. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. John 6, 63, it is the spirit who gives life. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Mark 10, 45, the son of man came to give his life as a ransom for many. James 1, 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all. James 1, 17, every good and perfect gift is from above. Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? The fellowship, I could go on, and 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 I could go on. This is your God. This is the heart of our God. And this is but a tiny sample of all the verses that speak of God's abundant, overwhelming generosity towards us. You see, the God we worship, giving for him is not a sometimes thing. Giving for him is not a, they can have the scraps, no. Giving for him is his very nature, and he gives abundantly to us, and he gives his best to us, namely himself. And because we're made in his image, we can give this way to him. I'll tell you that in my journey, uh, this is the most compelling thing. That as I really recognize, as God showed me all that he has given to me, I thought, who am I to withhold anything from him? But it's not under compulsion. It's not like, well, God gave it to me, so I guess I've got to give it back to him. No. It's that God loves us so much that he has poured himself. Can we put that slide back up just for a second, please? God loves us so much that he has poured himself out, and that's just seven examples. Look at it again. That is the heart of God. That is the generosity of God, and we are the beneficiaries and recipients of it. And because he has given to us, he is asking us to give to him in the way that he has given to us. Not because he demands it, even though he does command it, but because, oh my gosh, our Lord loves us so much that he's poured himself out that way. And what a, what a beautiful opportunity for us to turn around and say, Lord, I'm going to give it back to you. 
that we would give our best back to God, that we would do so regularly. And my encouragement all of, in all of that is that when you and I are giving generously and abundantly and giving the best of ourselves, we are acting in our most natural state possible. Why? Because we're made in the image of God and we have the heart of Christ. I love it when someone tells my boys, you're acting just like your dad. Sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes that's not so good of a thing. When we give abundantly and when we give generously and when we give sacrificially, you are acting just like your father in heaven. Just like your father in heaven. What an awesome opportunity to show him, to give back to him, and to respond to his generous love for us. Now, I really could stop there. I said that was the most important thing. I think we could just stop there. But I want to start there because there's more for us to see. But none of it's going to make sense until we understand the generous heart of God. But if we understand that, the rest of this is going to make a lot of sense. So God is abundantly generous. The second wonderful truth, heart-changing truth, is that God owns everything. God is the creator of all. And here's a rule that you may or may not agree with, but I'm going to argue, uh, if you don't agree with it, that he who creates owns. And you might say, I don't know about that. Well, I'd like to invite you to go downstairs right now to our kids' ministry area because there's a three-year-old who is building something rather magnificent, and what is he going to do if someone else comes up and grabs it? Mine! He who creates owns. God's a little more beneficent than that. But the principle is the same. Psalm 24 says it this way. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. Everything, everything, everything belongs to God, and that includes you and me. And when we can recognize that, it really changes the way we view our stuff, and it changes the belief that our stuff is really for us to do with as we please for all of our benefit. We are not owners we are stewards. This is what Garrett did a great job talking about a few weeks ago, that we are stewards, right? What does a steward do? A, st a steward takes care of something that belongs to someone else. Some of you may have been a house sitter at some point. What is it? What do you get to do as, as a house sitter? You get to go live in the house. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the owner, but you get to live in it. You get to be blessed by it, and you're asked to take care of it while the owner is away. That is what a steward is. Everything that you and I have does not belong to us. It is owned by God, and we are stewards of it. And we're stewards of it. This is a, a tremendous moment for us to recognize this. You ever had a DTR, a define the relationship conversation? Right? Mostly we use that, that, that phrase in romantic relationships, but this is a DTR that we get to have here. That there's a different relationship we have with our stuff because we don't own it. And if we can say, Lord, I, I, I'm going to change my relationship with my stuff, with my money, and say this does not belong to me, it belongs to you. Why? Because you own it. And if we change our relationship with our stuff, our heart for generosity is going to change as well. If we're going to confess to the Lord, Lord, this isn't mine, it's yours, the relationship changes. And once the relationship changes, then we can live into the next truth. Because not only does God own everything, but God gives everything. God gives everything, and he does so for a purpose. I don't know if you know what this is. It's cash. Does anybody use cash anymore? This is a dollar bill. The only reason I have it in my possession is because God has seen fit to give it to me. And there's really only three things I can do with this. I can save it, I can spend it, or I can give it away. That's really the only, I guess I could eat it. That wouldn't be very good. Every dollar that you have comes from the Lord, and you can save it, you can spend it, or you can give it. This is what Paul says as we continue in this passage. I want you to see the abundant grace of God and the purpose of the abundant grace of God starting in verse 8. And God is able to make, get ready, if you, if you don't have this highlighted in your Bible, highlight it. You're allowed to write in your Bible. If you need permission for that, I'm giving you permission. Underline this verse 8, underline it, highlight it, highlight it in your app. And God is able to make how much all grace abound to you. So that having all sufficiency in all things at 
all times you may abound in every good work. Our God does not hold back on us. He does not withhold anything from us. He is all sufficient at all times in all things. Verse 9, as it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. This is a passage that is so full of promise. This is so full of promise because as we talk about giving away our money, we are told that God takes care of those who are generous. Verse 8, all sufficiency in all things at all times. That means your needs will be met all the time. That means we don't have to hold on tightly. We don't ever have to say, oh my goodness, if I let go of any of this, I'm gonna, I'm, we're, we're, not gonna, we're gonna be without. And we can let it go. We don't have to be afraid God pours out his grace to fulfill the needs of our life. And here's the beautiful thing that generosity did for me and I believe can do for you. Generosity actually changes the way you view your stuff because it changes where your security is and it changes your level of thanksgiving because when you say, okay, I'm going to give, you have to take stock of what you own. You have to understand all of what you have. And my guess is for every person in this room, if we actually looked at what we would have, we would say, oh my goodness, Look at the abundant grace of God. Look at all that he has given me. What happens in that moment? My thanksgiving increases. My worship of the Lord because I see him as provider. But my security in that also changed. Because again, every time Martha and I gave, every time Martha and I gave more, we still had enough. We still had plenty to meet our needs. We still had plenty to take care of our boys' needs. And in God's upside-down economy, the more I gave away, the more I knew I would always have enough. Because God meets our needs. And when you believe that, your security goes to a different place. Your security is not in your stuff. Your security is not in a bank statement. Your security is not in how much stuff you have or money you have. Your security is in the one who gave it to you, the one who has promised to meet your needs, the one who has poured out his grace upon you. But I would not know that if I wasn't generous, if I didn't give. Because I would still be holding tight saying, okay, I believe what God's word says, but not really because I'm going to hold tight. It was only when I let go that I recognized that this is who God is. So God is going to meet your need. That's the first promise in this passage. The second is, the, is the, this next truth is that God also gives to givers. You see, God's going to give to us uh, to take care of us, but God is also going to pour out his grace on us so that we can pour out his grace on others. Uh, verse, verse 11, you have been enriched in every way. Why? To be generous in every way. Not so that you can be rich and be self-indulgent and do it all for yourself. God's not opposed to people having a whole lot, but you have been enriched. Why? To be generous to other people. We talk a lot about God-given purpose. We say you have a God-given purpose. Every dollar that you have has a God-given purpose to it. And some of these dollars are used to take care, or have a purpose of taking care of you and yours, and some of these dollars have a purpose of taking care of others because they are yours by the grace of God and they've been given to you to be generous to others. And he gives us all we need to do that. God is so eager to pour out his grace on us if our heart is to turn around and pour that out on others. God gives to givers. And if we believe that, our outlook on our stuff, and I keep saying this phrase, our outlook on our stuff is going to change. Our, our area of, our, our, our focus of satisfaction, our contentment, it's not going to be on our stuff anymore. 
You see, when we're so wrapped up in our stuff, we say, well, only this can truly satisfy me. But you know what? Those with the most stuff have the most anxiety in this world. Why? Because they have to keep taking care of their stuff. They have to keep adding to their stuff. They keep looking for their stuff to satisfy them, and they're putting the weight of the satisfaction of their heart on something that simply can't satisfy, so they keep adding and keep adding and keep adding. But man, if we're generous... We know that God is going to meet our needs, and we know that God is going to use us to meet other people's needs. And that means our life is no longer about what we have. It becomes about what we can do with what we have. It's the amazing opportunity that God has given us here. Now, I I do want to say this. I I thought about it. I, I think it's worthwhile just taking a moment because this passage has been so misused over the years, particularly by those who... Uh, purport to proclaim the prosperity gospel. This, this passage will often be used to say, if you give, you will get rich. That, that if I give the dollar in my pocket here, give it away, that two dollars is, is miraculously going to appear in this pocket. And normally there's a request to send in some seed money to some dude on TV who has a private jet. Don't do it. That's not what God's asking of us. That's not what God is promising here. He is not saying give and you will get rich for yourself. He is saying you will be enriched. If you give, I will keep giving you and giving you and giving you. Why? So that you can turn around and give to others. So that you can be the conduit of my grace. That's what Jesus is telling us through Paul in this passage. And that's the awesome opportunity for generosity. So God is abundantly generous. God owns everything. God has given us everything. God gives to givers for the purpose of giving it away. And then here's the fifth truth. That God cares less about the size of the gift and more about the size of the heart that gives the gift. In the next few weeks, you're going to get a letter from me. And it's going to talk about what we need to finish the year on budget. And the number that I give you is probably going to have a few zeros attached to it. And for a lot of you, man, you're going to say, oh, I, I can't make a dent in that. I, why should I even bother giving? Well, there's two reasons. First is, every gift helps. But more importantly, every gift matters because every gift matters to God, no matter the size. Why? Because we're talking about our heart. Every gift matters because every gift matters to God. And this is ultimately about our heart and about our relationship with the Lord. Jesus shows us this in Mark 12. Many of you know the passage about what's called the widow's might. They're, they're taking up a collection for the treasury of the, of the temple. And there are very wealthy people coming and putting very large gifts into uh, whatever container uh, that they are collecting these. And here comes a widow, and all she has is two pennies. But here's what we're told about those two pennies. It's all she has in the world. It is the abundance of her possessions. She has nothing else other than these two pennies. And what does she do? She gives them in this collection. And this is what Jesus says about her. Truly, I say to you, This poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box, for they contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Jesus is not knocking those who are wealthy. Jesus is commending this woman and saying her gift is bigger in his eyes because of the size of the sacrifice that she is making and the trust that she has in the Lord as she is doing so. She's not reluctant in this moment. She is not uh, being forced to do this. It's not a compulsive uh, act of her. She does this willingly and she does this joyfully because she is so committed to the Lord and she has trusted him with the rest because God is going to take care of her and she believes that in this moment because God cares about what the heart is saying in, when we give. I think if we wrestle with these two words of, of, uh, of reluctant and compulsion, you know, a lot of people read this passage and go, man, well, if... If, if my heart isn't necessarily right when I give, because it's kind of reluctant and it's kind of under, I probably shouldn't give. That is not what Paul is saying here. 
Remember, the New Testament, all of what Paul is saying is he's saying, listen, the, the law is fulfilled by Jesus. We are no longer under the law. We're no longer under the tithe. The tithe is 10%. Many of you give a tithe of 10%, and if that is what you and the Lord have decided, then that is awesome. Okay? If you look at all of the Old Testament law, really what they're asked to give is a little bit over 20% of all of their possessions uh, to, to the work of the Lord. But for every Jew who is doing that, many of them are just doing it road. They don't even, it's almost thoughtless, like, yep, this is what the law tells me, I'm going to go do it. This is what the law tells me, I'm going to go do it. And we can get into such a rhythm like that that our heart is no longer engaged in it. And Paul is saying, no, quit, quit being tied to this old way of doing things and expand your heart. What is it that God is actually calling you to? Maybe it is 10%. Maybe it's something way more than that. He's looking at our heart. See, one of the questions that I would say Jesus would ask of us is, is our standard of giving keeping up with our standard of living? Because Jesus wants us to look at our hearts. He is testing our hearts, and he knows that we can show our faithfulness and our love and our devotion and our trust in him. And that may be $5, it may be $50, it may be $500,000, it may be $5 million. Only you and God know. Only you and God know what truly costs you. And he's asking you to give your heart to him, and as you do, to give your dollars based on that. To respond, because he is a generous God. So I have one application for you this week as we enter into this series, and that is to get your hearts checked. And that is to go to the Lord and ask him to check your heart. And see, if this passage says that we should give what we have decided in our heart to give, we need to check our heart to see why we've decided what we've decided. What is it that's going on in our heart that is causing us to give like we do? And I want to encourage everybody in this room, everybody online, everybody in our church, myself included, is that we would pray a bold and courageous prayer and say, Lord, what is it that you would have me decide? And Lord, if I am reluctant, if this feels like it's under compulsion, show me what's going on in my heart. Where is my security? Where am I looking for my satisfaction? I read this passage and I want to be generous, Lord. Would you show me what's going on in my heart so that I can give it over to you? And would you remind me, Lord, of how generous you have been to me? It might be uncomfortable. It is certainly courageous. It is certainly bold. And it is a prayer that God will answer. Because money is a big deal and giving is about our heart. And what I believe, what I believe, what I believe is that if you pray that prayer, God is ultimately going to show you this. The generosity is not about the process by which you are separated from your money. It really is the practice that he calls us to that leads to his glory, that leads to his thanksgiving, that leads to blessing for others, that leads to our transformation, and ultimately leads to a life of joy. I don't know about you, but if that's what it's about, I want to be a part of that. Amen? And so here's how we're going to end this morning. I want to just give you a minute to, as the worship band sings over you, to think about your own giving, your own generosity. We're going to have a slide on the screen about how you can give. There's a QR code on the seat back in front of you if you want to scan that. If you want to have a conversation with me about the needs of Fellowship Dallas because you'd love to contribute to those, man, I'm all for that. But we want to give you a moment to be with the Lord. For him to show you his heart for you and to show you what's going on in your heart. And as we do that, then I'm going to come back up. And as we talk about what we give, we're going to, be, we're going to celebrate and remember what Jesus has given to us.
Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. He washed it white as closest friends and he gave his church a celebration, a time to remember all that he has given to us and over the last 2,000 years we have gathered as his body and we've remembered and we've celebrated and we've worshipped and we so look forward to the day that he's going to come back and finish the job and so this morning as we talk about generosity, we remember our infinitely generous Savior. Because on the night that he was betrayed, he gathered his friends and he broke bread and he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this and remember me. And then he took the cup and again he gave thanks and praise. And he said, this is the cup of my blood in the new covenant. A covenant where I am going to do everything and you have to do nothing. Just believe. This has been shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. The blood of Christ shed for you. And so I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to finish this song, and we are going to praise the one who is infinitely generous. stain he washed it white as snow thank you jesus thank you for your cross thank you for your amazing generosity and love that you shower upon us lord you are our king you are our savior and we delight in your love we delight in your generosity father may we be a people who reflect who you have been to us back to this world and back to one another fill us with love fill us with compassion and fill us with generosity marked by your spirit, Jesus. In your mighty and holy name, we pray together. Amen. We'll see you next week, church. Y'all go in peace.